After the resounding meh of Power Rangers Zeo, it was time for the Power Rangers to shift into the next gear, both metaphorically and literally. Power Rangers Turbo was meant to be the next step for our team of heroes, growing up and dealing with more mature and serious problems. This was meant to be the Power Rangers that took things seriously. But there were a few roadblocks, one of which being that the Sentai that Turbo was based off of, Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger, was incredibly goofy and unserious, even for Power Ranger standards. Car Ranger was a bit of a parody of Super Sentai. Being the 20th season in Japan, the franchise was chock full of tropes that Car Ranger would be self-aware of. The weirdness and absurdity would work and be a massive success in Japan. But for Power Rangers, adapting a parody season for your new serious season wouldn't make things easy. But would they be able to overcome it? Well, let's see what we have in store when we shift into Turbo. We kick things off with... Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. Oh, that's right. For the first and only time ever in Power Rangers, the new season would kick off with a full theatrical movie. Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. Unlike the Mighty Morphin movie, Turbo is canon, so if we were to just jump into Episode 1 as a completely new viewer, you'd probably be a little lost. Now, without getting too ahead of myself, I hated this movie as a kid. I thought it was so boring, so lame, and even Johnny Young Bosch made a joke during a panel saying that you don't need to watch this. But hey, maybe it's not as bad as I remember? The movie kicks off with a Star Wars text crawl and narration. We see this ugly little wizard named Larago being chased by the Piranatron, this season's new foot soldiers. We then cut to Angel Grove where Kat and Tanya are volunteering at the homeless shelter, where they're making these preteens sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Everyone's for some reason having fun, except this one kid, Justin. He doesn't want to sing, and I don't blame him, he's not three. Something finally happens when Tommy, Adam, and Rocky are training for a karate tournament, where Rocky tries to push himself too hard, doing a spinning kick and somehow manages to fly out of the ring. This fall was pretty serious, putting him in the hospital. Justin goes to check on him, but he's not supposed to leave the group. When he hears the others come into the room, he hides under Rocky's bed. They hope he gets well soon, but quickly gets summoned to the command center, where Justin overhears this and even sees them teleporting away, putting two and two together and finding out that they're the Power Rangers. We also get some weird retconning, with Balkan Skull now being back on the police force with Detective Stone. He says they were all given one more chance, but like, why? The three of them were pretty happy being detectives. I think that Zeo's ratings were so bad towards the middle of the show that they just assumed nobody even saw the ending of Zeo. We then cut to our season's new villain, Divatox. She's a space pirate with a very, very big personality. Oh, shut up, Elgar! She is annoying, a lot like Rita with her overacting and temper tantrums. Alongside her are her two generals, Rygog and her cousin Elgar. He'll be our epic comic relief. Her plan is to revive and marry a powerful fire demon named Malagor. Anyway, Zordon informs the rangers of everything I just told you. Great, we can skip ahead. As a wedding gift for Malagor, Divatox manages to kidnap both Jason and Kimberly. Whoa! Amy Jo Johnson returning for this movie. She has never returned to the franchise since. I'm blaming that solely on this. Meanwhile, the rangers go on a mission to save Larago before Divatox takes him. They succeed, but Divatox still manages to steal Larago's family and threatens to end them if Larago doesn't turn himself over. Which he does, and the rangers get tricked. So this is where somehow the movie gets even worse. Zordon tells the rangers that Divatox and Malagor will be such a devastating threat that they need new powers. So Zordon opens up a secret door in the power chamber and shows them the weapons that will save the world. Cars. This magical SUV will be the answer. They have a ceremony and shoot this beam of light into the rangers, and there you go! New powers, new suits. No grandeur, no epic moment, it's just like, here you go, hop in the car. There's clearly a lot wrong here. Like, why did they need the new powers? Cat kind of started to morph into her Zeo Ranger form, but that's it. They never even tried to fight the Piranatron with their Zeo powers. Why are you immediately giving up and assuming you need car powers? Secondly, where did they even come from? A popular theory is that this is what Billy was constantly disappearing to to work on during the Gold Ranger arc in Zeo. 
but that's never been confirmed. Also, the car thing is kinda lame. We had dinosaur powers, ninja powers, ancient crystal powers, and now Jeep. Kind of a step back in my opinion. But wait, with Rocky's back being broken, who could possibly take on the role as the new Blue Ranger? Guys, I'm the new Blue Ranger. Isn't that cool or what? Oh, the 12 year old orphan. Okay, it's only the fate of the world, Zordon. You gave the Rangers new powers because you thought the Zeo Crystals wouldn't be strong enough, but you equipped those new powers to a child. Okay, this decision would leave quite the impact. I'll go more into my thoughts after the movie, but for now, yeah, Justin is our first and only 12 year old Ranger. Now there's still like an hour left of this movie, but it's all so skippable and boring. The Rangers need to go on this haunted pirate ship to search for the island where Diva Talks is reviving Malagor. You know, since the minivan can't drive on water. Already these powers are proving useless. There's a fight scene with some monsters on the boat, but the Rangers eventually do make it to the island. And an hour and ten minutes into this Power Rangers movie, the teens finally morph into the Power Rangers. <laughs> I actually like this morphing sequence. They mimic steering a wheel before shoving the keys into the wrist contraption. Then they say the names of the new cars that no one will remember. Red Lightning Turbo Power! And since Car Ranger didn't use a child Blue Ranger, Justin just magically stretches and grows to the size of a normal adult. You know how I know this movie is bad? Because the big epic final fight is boring. The Rangers show up and fight the bad guys. Malagor gets revived when Diva Talks shoves Elgar into the fire and sacrifices him. Jesus, that's your nephew, what the heck? Malagor's costume is actually pretty sick. I like it. Anyway, the Rangers fight a hypnotized Kimberly and Jason, but cure them with the power of friendship. The Rangers then use the Zords to fight Malagor and, of course, defeat him. They send Diva Talks back into hiding, win the martial arts tournament with Jason instead of Rocky, and that's the end of the Turbo Movie. It's still very bad, and everything is kinda wrong. The pacing is bad, and the movie just feels like a TV show. Nothing feels grand. Like, the suits are the same ones they use in the TV show. At least the Mighty Morphin movie made new custom suits that had a cool armor look to them. This feels like this could have been a three-parter. Nothing about Turbo Scream's important movie. A lot of Power Rangers fans also hated the inclusion of Justin as the new Blue Ranger. People thought, what is this stupid little kid doing on my Power Rangers? I felt that way too when I was a kid. Which is weird, because Justin was older than me at the time. I was like 8 when I first saw Turbo, I was an actual stupid little kid. Upon rewatching Turbo though, Justin is honestly fine. He never actually annoyed me at any point. Maybe that's just because with how Power Rangers has been under the Neo Saban and Hasbro era, with characters consistently and actively being annoying, Justin is the least of my problems. I guess people just hated the concept of it. Like, if a little kid can do this, how incompetent must the older teens be to be all on the same level? Steve Cardenas, who played Rocky, wanted to leave the show to open up his own martial arts dojo. And during Power Rangers Zeo, another show made its way onto the scene. Big Bad Beetleborgs. It was the same concept as Power Rangers, but with the main characters being pre-teen kids. Beetleborgs was actually way more successful than Zeo, viewership-wise. So, I guess to capitalize on that, Power Rangers thought a kid would boost ratings? I guess we'll see if it worked. But with the movie out of the way, we can finally jump into the TV show! Shift into Turbo Part 1. I guess we should actually talk about the theme song. It's pretty catchy. Nowhere near my favorite, but still plenty of energy, and even manages to still sneak in the Go Go Power Rangers bit. Power Rangers the episode kicks off with Diva Talks vowing revenge on the Rangers. She's also played by a completely different woman. This is Carol Hoyt, and she'll play Diva Talks for about the first half of the season. However, Hilary Shepard, who played the character in the movie, would return for the remainder of Diva Talks' existence after Carol Hoyt. Hilary Shepard was apparently pregnant when they hired her. Why would you hire a pregnant woman who you know you're gonna need for a long period of time? Whatever. We then cut to the Rangers, who are graduating high school. Yeah, Turbo was meant to take everything to the next level. It's an interesting concept. The Rangers are out of high school and now need to deal with adult problems. 
Like Tommy, who spends the entire episode racing a car. Classic Tommy, I guess. Meanwhile, Justin takes a placement exam since he's new in town to try and figure out what grade he'll be in. Rocky makes his last appearance for the season to officially pass down the torch to Justin. He asks about their adventure and we get a whole montage of the movie! Seriously, it's like two minutes of the theme song just flashing over the important stuff. So, I guess we could have skipped the movie? Anyway, Diva Talks creates another general because I guess we don't have enough. This is Porto, and he's essentially the finster of the season. The bumbling, weak inventor. Also, Elgar is back! Diva Talks literally pushed him into a fiery abyss, but whatever, he's back now with no explanations. She sends Elgar to place bombs to blow up the power plant, but he's intercepted by Bulk and Skull. And hey, to add on to their character development, they actually try to stand their ground and fight him. However, Elgar has a device that... It turns Bulk and Skull into monkeys where they will remain for a good bit of the show. The behind-the-scenes reason for this is because Paul Schreier and Jason Narvey were filming a Balkan Skull pilot that would never sadly see the light of day. But yeah, they're monkeys now. How mature and serious, right? While the Rangers are busy with graduation, Justin is at the power chamber and notices something going on at the power plant. He teleports there and shows off some sick martial arts, even beating up Elgar unmorphed. But for how long can this boy survive on his own? Part 2 kicks off with Justin morphing, and it's the same morphing sequence from the movie. Once again, Power Rangers steals from itself. Meanwhile, Adam, Cat, and Tanya need to sneak away from graduation to help Justin. But Tommy isn't there? They say he picked up his diploma early, which is odd. But before they can help Justin, Diva Talks ambushes them. We get a nice unmorphed fight, which we rarely ever got in Zeo. They beat up the Piranatron and morph on out. Tommy also has to step away from his busy day of driving a race car to morph and help the others. Shit to the turbo! The rest of the episode has the Rangers fighting the Piranatron and finding the detonator. Justin teleports to the command center for a device that could locate the bombs, but when he shows up, Alpha and Zordon are acting very sketchy. But with no time to worry about that, Justin gets the device and they manage to stop the bomb, save the power plant, and make it to graduation on time. Lieutenant Stone also comes across the monkeys and gets a liking to them, saying they have a very familiar vibe to them. Part 2 ends with Larago of all people coming back to the command center to tell Zordon and Alpha some very important news. Where Part 3 naturally kicks off with more Tommy race car nonsense, why is this happening? Although we do get some nice dialogue between Adam, Cat, and Tanya, talking about their next steps in life. They'll all be doing some kind of work over the summer. We also learn that Justin is a bit of a genius and gets placed into high school. Before everyone can celebrate though, the Rangers are summoned to the power chamber, where Alpha is crying, Larago is chillin', and Zordon has some news. With Larago's powerful magic, he's here to free Zordon from his time warp and allow him to go home to Eltar to be with his family. And Alpha will be joining him. Yeah, this is goodbye for Zordon. A bit out of the blue, <laughs> get it? But thematically, makes tons of sense. Zordon has been the Ranger's mentor for years. In a way, he's like their father. And with the teenagers with attitude now being adults and needing to grow up, they're not going to be able to come running to Zordon for help and answers all the time anymore. Zordon feels like the Rangers will do great without him. He's watched them mature and become the brave men and women they are now. Except for you, Justin, sorry. Diva Talks decides to mess with the portal that would rescue Zordon. She summons a monster to fight the Rangers. It's a pretty long Megazord sequence that goes on for a bit. But after they destroy the monster, Zordon and Alpha safely get teleported to Eltar. However, Zordon didn't want to leave the Rangers completely on their own, so he requested the help of a woman named Demetria from the planet Inquiris, as well as a new Alpha, Alpha 6. Yeah, 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 that's me, all right. Oh, for God's sakes, he's gonna talk like that for the rest of the season, isn't he? Demetria will act as our new Zordon. However, she's way more useless. Being from the planet Inquiris, she only speaks in questions. You get it? Do you know who we are? Do you know who you are? We're the Power Rangers. Is not who you are much more than the Power Rangers, Tommy? It does get very annoying, but again, it works thematically. The Rangers aren't just given answers anymore. They need to think for themselves. Diva Talks also vows revenge. 
The shift in the Turbo 3 parter was honestly very good. Honestly, way better than the movie. You should have just canned the movie altogether and started with this. There was a lot that happened here. The Rangers graduating high school and taking their next steps into adulthood. No more high school projects, dance plot lines. Hopefully the Ranger storylines manage to keep up a somewhat mature pace. The Bulk and Skull stuff is very boring. They do still talk via voiceover, but the actual shenanigans is just monkey business. Alpha 6 is very annoying. He's from Brooklyn, I guess, and has an attitude. Gone is the sweet and friendly Alpha, and instead we have a wisecracking loudmouth. I have mixed feelings going forward, but I ultimately do have high hopes for the season already. This intro did way more right than the Zeo beginnings. So let's see what else we have in store. Shadow Rangers. We start off with Justin accidentally ruining Tommy's race car and blowing up the engine. Honestly? Good. Meanwhile, Divatox gets a monster that's able to zap the Rangers' powers and use them for herself. She targets Adam, Kat, and Tanya first. During their morphing sequence, the monster blasts the Rangers and it steals their powers. With it, it's able to create the Shadow Rangers, which are just evil versions of the Rangers with colorless helmets for some reason. Four episodes in and the Rangers already lost their powers to a random monster. Yeah, this is really an upgrade from the Zeo Crystals. Justin and Tommy go check it out where Justin morphs and the same thing happens, meaning it's up to Tommy to save the day. It's a really well-paced episode though, lots of unmorphed Tommy fighting with the Shadow Rangers. He once again asks Demetria for help, which is pointless because she just asks questions. It turns out the Shadow Rangers are made from actual shadows and can be defeated by removing a light source. Everyone's being held in a cave and Tommy needs to blast his way to save everyone. The Rangers get their powers back and defeat the monster. The episode ends with yet another shakeup, with Lieutenant Stone now being the owner of Ernie's juice bar. They say that Ernie was called back for military duty, making all that police stuff at the beginning ultimately pointless. I also want to mention that Richard Janelle, the man who played Ernie, would sadly pass away in 2008 from a heart attack. Rest in peace, Ernie. Transmission Impossible. We see that Tanya's hard at work with her new summer job at the radio station. Meanwhile, the Rangers get a radio message from outer space. The voice says he's on his way to Earth to meet Demetria. However, Divatox intercepts the message and manages to capture this mysterious being. His name is Visceron, and he's a friend of Demetria from Inquiris. Elgar is sent to place bombs around the radio station to blow it up, because Porto told Divatox that the frequency of the message came from there. Divatox then brainwashes and puts a disguise on Visceron, sending him to Earth to cause destruction. The Rangers, not knowing who Visceron is, just attack him because he's a monster. It's a pretty smart plan. The Rangers almost destroy him, while also stopping the detonator from blowing up the radio station. But when they realize what's going on, he's taken to the command center to be healed. I love it, the Rangers are like, oops, sorry we almost killed your friend. He comes bearing a message for Demetria, saying that she's not an only child and actually has a twin sister. I'm just gonna say it now, this never gets brought up again and goes forever unanswered. However, it's believed amongst the fans that her twin sister is Divatox, mainly because when Demetria first came onto the scene, Divatox had a very visceral and personal reaction to it. If there's one person I can't stand, it's Demetria. They're also both played by the same woman. Rally Ranger. Justin is taking part in a boxcar derby race. There's this kid who's mean to Justin and constantly bullies him, making him feel like an outcast, you know, because he's an orphan and is also super smart. That's the main focus of this episode, Justin dealing with insecurities. Although, the insecurity is that he's just super smart. Tommy's like, hey man, don't feel bad for being a genius. It's a very weird approach, like, now I'm starting to dislike Justin for that too. Divatox then does what Divatox does. She plants a bomb inside the bully kid's rally car, oh my god. I guess so he can drive into a populated place and blow up everyone. Okay, you terrorist. However, the Rangers of course save the day, and the bully being faced with a near-death experience changes his tune about Justin. Built for speed. We get these 50s greasers dancing at the diner and almost getting into a fight but it turns out it's just for... a movie. But then these greasers are like, arguing for real that this gang always gets to win the fight. You know, the imaginary fight because it's scripted. These actors need to be fired. They're upset because their characters don't get to win. 
They also still act like greasers when they're outside talking to each other. Like, are the writers of this season that out of touch they think this is what cool is? They then decide to have a street race to decide who wins the fake fight in this play? It's so stupid. But Adam, of course, is like, hey guys, that's illegal and dangerous. I don't know who's lamer. Anyway, a monster attacks, Divatox plants another bomb in the Greaser's car, the Rangers destroy it, and the monster. And the Greasers still race, but almost die, but get saved by the Megazord. It's so stupid and pointless. What did we learn from this? Nothing. Shift into turbo! Desert Thunder Turbo Power! Bicycle built for the blues. The Rangers are planning a surprise birthday party for Justin. But he can't find out about it, so they act like they don't know it's his birthday, ultimately upsetting Justin because he feels like they forgot. This is one of those universal Power Rangers plots you can use in every season. Divatox then leaves a bike for Justin, saying that it's from his dad. However, it's an evil bicycle, because it glues Justin to the seat and puts a spell on him that makes him continuously pedal. There's also an odometer on the bike that counts backwards, and when it reaches zero, you guessed it, the bike blows up. Jesus, Divatox sure likes killing children. I'm sure you've noticed the pattern by now. Divatox's plans always involve just planting bombs and blowing things up, which I guess is an effective plan. Divatox is just a pirate, her plans should use guerrilla tactics, and at least she's not making the rangers smell bad or sending a pudgy pig to eat all the food. The whole episode is just one big chase scene to get Justin off the bike. Tommy manages to do it by tackling him really hard, but not before blasting at him to try and stop the bike. The episode ends with a surprise party, and we get to see Justin's adopted dad for the first time. Wow! The whole lie. Justin gets hit with a ray that makes him constantly tell lies. Every time he lies, it spawns in a Piranatron. That's basically it. Justin just keeps telling lies until they find out what's going on. They make him stop talking until they destroy the monster. The first real whatever episode, in my opinion. Glyph Hanger. Adam is once again filming another movie as a stunt double for his summer job. The first one was the Greaser episode. Meanwhile, Divatox teams up with her ex-husband for this episode. He's an evil demon pharaoh, but like, he comes to Earth and immediately gets beaten up by random kids. That's it, it's over, he's not a threat. Anyway, he uses his powers to turn everything into hieroglyphics, which is an inconvenience, but doesn't really do anything. So the rangers gotta fight the bad guy to reverse the spell. I don't see what the big evil scheme was with this one. Wait and see. Kat is auditioning for some ballet recital when a snarky girl gives her attitude and calls her fat. She does it over and over again to the point where Kat starts to feel bad, skipping out on meals and having body image issues. It's a pretty serious topic that naturally Power Rangers does not handle very well, because we immediately cut from that to Justin and Adam ogling cute girls on the beach. Good job. Anyway, Divatox sends down a math monster that can add or subtract weight to people but not visually. For example, he hits Cat and she becomes light as a feather. The rangers have to do battle until Cat learns that it doesn't matter what she looks like on the outside. What? Like, sure, that's supposed to be the moral of her being called fat, but it comes out of nowhere. Demetria gives fake wisdom and Cat just randomly comes up with that revelation, which cancels the spell. It's such a forced moral of the day. Literally nothing happened to Kat to make her come to this revelation. Alarmed and dangerous. Justin is getting bullied by these grown-ass adults because they want to cheat on the test. Justin says no, but it causes a scene where the three of them get kicked out of class. The bullies then pull the fire alarm and Justin rats on them. Where naturally they want to beat up this 12-year-old kid. Meanwhile, Divatox has a plan to set off all of Angel Grove's fire alarms as a distraction while she plants a bomb. The episode's moral is also very... confusing and bad? The bullies try to go Justin into a fight, where he reaches into his back pocket to pull out his morpher, but for a second it looks like Justin is pulling out a switchblade to shank these kids. It's hilarious. Anyway, Kat tells Justin that he shouldn't resort to violence and fight. But Justin specifically says, I need to defend myself, Cat. I'm gonna have to defend myself, Cat. If you wanted Justin to learn a lesson, shouldn't he say something like, I'm gonna beat up those kids so they don't mess with me? Or something? 
You know, in this TV show about fighting the bad guys, maybe it's okay to teach kids that physical defense is sometimes okay. While the rangers are sent to spread out around town to find the bomb, Justin runs into the bullies again. Where they try to fight him, and Justin straight up counters one of them and is on the verge of beating him up. Before coming to his senses. It's over for that bully, bro. Pack it in. How are you supposed to continue when this 12-year-old almost thrashed you? They chase Justin throughout the park where he teleports away, potentially in the bully's sights. Where Cat once again gives Justin a hard time for teleporting in broad daylight. So, okay, Cat tells Justin that he shouldn't fight, and when he tries to run away, it's also the wrong thing to do. So, what's Cat's solution for Justin? I'm sure you'll think of something. I'm speechless. Anyway, the rangers find the bomb and destroy the monster, where naturally Justin and the bully become friends over mutual trauma. Talking about how they both don't have parents anymore. Thanks, Power Rangers, that's the answer. Share your trauma and insecurities with the bully. How could that ever go wrong? The Millennium Message This weird-looking police officer crashes down on Earth. He's the Blue Centurion, basically an intergalactic police officer. He comes bearing a message for Demetria, where Diva Talks does an impression of her in order to trick him. It's a pretty important message, though. All of the galaxy's evil forces are uniting together for a grand scheme and there's only one force that's in their way. Where we get to see the Machine Empire, Zed, and Rita. Anyway, Diva Talks reprograms the Blue Centurion so that he thinks the Rangers are the bad guys. It's a pretty good episode. There's a lot of fighting and trying to jog the Blue Centurion's memory. They eventually manage to get him back on the side of good and unofficially becomes the sixth Ranger. Kinda. A drive to win. Adam is coaching a soccer team where we get introduced to some new characters. First one is Carlos. He's a star athlete who likes showing off. Adam tells him the importance of teamwork and that he shouldn't just always hog the ball. The other new character is Ashley. She's a cheerleader. I like Ashley. Diva Talk spies on them for some reason and decides to plant the bomb at the soccer game. Why not? She sends down some Piranatron and Adam has to fight them off alone. However, Carlos and Ashley stick around and manage to hold their own. The rest of the episode has two stories. The Rangers fighting the monster and Carlos needing to learn the importance of teamwork. The Ranger stuff is mostly Sentai footage, where we get to see the Sentai version of Elgar, and he's way creepier. I wish they kept this suit. Cars attacks. Cat's auditioning for another ballet thing and meets a girl she's trying to be friends with. But she's acting very closed off and honestly kinda bitchy. That's the human plot line. The Ranger stuff is Take a guess. Does it involve fighting a random monster that also planted a bomb somewhere? And the rangers gotta fight it and defuse said bomb? Correct! The episode has kind of a funny ending though, where Cat tries to talk to the mean girl who didn't get accepted into the dance school because of her attitude. The girl's then like, what, is this where we have a heart to heart and become friends? And Cat's reply is this. Look Jenny, I didn't even know if I'd want to be your friend. You're mean, you're rude, and you alienate yourself from everybody. Dang, get roasted, nerd. Honey, I Shrunk the Rangers Part 1. Heck, while I'm here, let's just also throw in Part 2. So, the Rangers, minus Justin, get captured by Elgar and the Piranatron, where they get blasted and shrunk down to mini-size. Yeah, Elgar captured the Rangers. Meanwhile, a fly monster gets into the head of the Blue Centurion, causing him to go crazy and partake in shenanigans. We also get a lot of bulk and skull monkey business. They hijack Detective Stone's car and go on a joyride. This goes on for way longer than it needs to. The rangers get kidnapped and brought to Diva Tox's base. What ensues is a lot of tiny rangers home alone shenanigans. They interact with big things trying to escape. The villains also do a lot of silly slapstick. Just like those bullies who almost got beaten up by Justin, they lose a lot of credibility and threat. It's honestly a weird episode they decided to make into a two-parter. The rangers get their size back though by launching missiles at themselves, which is the method Diva Talks uses to make her monsters grow. So that's kind of funny. But now we've reached some important episodes. Passing of the Torch, Part 1. In this two-parter, Kat, Tanya, Adam, and Tommy no longer stay the Power Rangers but I'll talk about all of the behind-the-scenes stuff after we talk about the two-parter. We start off with two new characters, TJ and Cassie. 
Cassie is singing terribly on the bus while TJ politely makes her stop. They hit it off pretty quickly, where we learn that TJ is going to Angel Grove to become a baseball player and Cassie wants to be a singer. God have mercy. We spend some time getting to know these new characters. TJ is an overall responsible and friendly person, while Cassie has a bit of an edge. Meanwhile, Tommy and Kat get attacked by Divatox's monster, literally blowing up the truck they were driving, oh my god. Tommy gets knocked out and taken away, leaving Kat all on her own to fight the Piranatron. TJ notices something and immediately goes to check it out, with Cassie hesitantly following. Meanwhile, Adam, Tanya, and Justin are on a camping trip, but they also get attacked by a monster and for some reason don't morph. Justin's morpher gets knocked out of his hand, but Adam and Tanya just stay in their human forms, I guess. TJ and Cassie manage to find the wreckage with Kat being outnumbered. TJ immediately jumps into action while Cassie wants to leave, but eventually joins up. What ensues is a really solid unmorphed fight. There's more drama and tension than usual, with Cat being all beaten up, the destroyed truck, the tone is very serious. No Ron Wasserman music or anything. The only thing that's weird about it is that it's the Piranatron. It's like having a dramatic battle with the putties. But yeah, that's just a minor nitpick. It's still a really good scene. Cassie also says this during the fight. Where did you learn to do that? Ancestors invented it. So with the Rangers fighting for their lives and momentarily split up from each other, and Tommy being held captive, how will our hero survive? Part 2 kicks off with Adam, Tanya, and Justin finally morphing and destroying the monster, with the Rangers then meeting up with Kat to check on her, thanking TJ and Cassie in the process. They're told to leave and that the Power Rangers will take care of everything, but on their way back, TJ notices something suspicious and decides that he can't just sit back and do nothing, so he investigates. Cassie initially, once again, doesn't come along because she clearly doesn't want to jump into the dangers, but comes around and joins her new friend. Demetria also introduces an hourglass, and says that the Rangers have that amount of time to finish their mission. Why? What happens if the hourglass runs out? Who knows, they never give an explanation, it's just there for the sake of drama. Tommy's also being held captive in a cave where rats are slowly chewing on rope for him to fall into the evil abyss. And nobody is of course watching him. The rangers are sent to deal with the monster that's destroying the town. We even get to see the destruction it causes with civilians running away and even the army, what? Carlos and Ashley are also there helping the rangers evacuate the citizens. TJ and Cassie eventually stumble across the cave and once again need to fight some Piranatron, while also rescuing Tommy from his doom. They manage to succeed and Tommy's very thankful. The rangers destroy the monster, stop the bomb, and are tasked with one final mission. Where Demetrius says it's time to proceed with the ceremony. What ceremony? The one we just established five minutes ago. The ceremony is given some real grandeur though, with both Zordon and Alpha showing up for a cameo. The turbo powers will be passed down to a new generation, with each veteran ranger giving respects to their new replacements. Cassie will be the new Pink Ranger, Ashley the Yellow, Carlos the Green, and TJ the Leader and Red Ranger. With Justin still remaining the blue because he just got here. And for the first time ever in Power Rangers, we completely say goodbye to the Mighty Morphin team and welcome in our new heroes. The passing of the Torch two-parter is really given some weight and grandeur, a bit of a precursor of things to come with the next season with its serious tone. But let's talk about what happened with the old cast. After the end of Zeo, Catherine Sutherland and Jason David Frank wanted to leave the show. It's unknown why Catherine wanted to leave, but it's confirmed that Jason David Frank wanted to leave because Saban refused to let him work other gigs, since Tommy was the most popular character on the show. I don't know how Hollywood works, but the fact Saban was apparently able to not let Jason David Frank take on roles outside Power Rangers with the poor pay we all know everyone was getting was insane. The producers managed to convince Catherine and Jason to stay for 19 episodes so they could properly organize replacements. As for Johnny Young Bosch and Nakia Baris, apparently they didn't want to leave the show but it was ultimately one of the producers who decided that it would just be easier to wipe the slate clean and start fresh with a whole new cast of characters. If that's true, that really sucks. That two main actors were just written off like nothing. 
Saban will never beat the asshole boss allegations. Fans have also pointed out that Johnny Young Bosch looks pretty sad during the final ceremony, even during points where everyone was supposed to be happy. As much as this sucks, I guess the team really had no choice. Turbo's ratings were in the garbage. They already tried one shakeup with Justin, but figured maybe some more fresh faces would be the solution. And to be fair, Turbo's ratings would slightly increase after the new team was introduced. What are my thoughts on this new team? Well, I'm honestly very biased. Without getting too far ahead of myself, this will be the new team for Power Rangers in Space. My absolute favorite season of all time. So yeah, of course I'm gonna like this new cast. If you want a little secret too, Ashley was my first ever crush. That's right, for most people it was Kimberly, but nah. -uh. The first time I saw Ashley, I immediately knew what love was. Please don't ever tell her actress Tracy Lynn Cruz about this. But I gotta try and look at things without the nostalgia goggles. Based off what we've seen so far, TJ and Cassie are the most interesting. On the surface, Carlos is a generic jock and Ashley is a generic cheerleader. But that can all change as we continue forward. So let's dive back into the series and see how the Power Rangers adjust to their new lives. Stitch Witchery. We start off at Angel Grove High where Ashley is in a fashion design class and a classmate is not impressed with her new jacket, which obviously hurts her feelings. So yeah, I guess the new rangers are still in school, meaning we're going back on that whole growing up thing and putting the rangers back in school. Meanwhile, Bulk and Skulk are doing invisible shenanigans. I don't think I mentioned this, but in the last episode, there was an explosion that turned the two back into humans, but they're now invisible, cool. Diva Talk sees that Ashley is upset by her uncool jacket and makes a monster that takes on the form of a fashion designer who wants to team up with Ashley and then creates evil flannels. So whenever someone wears Ashley's flannel, they become rude and aggressive. Okay, no bombs this time I guess, it's different. All the rangers try it on and naturally become mean, telling Ashley her design sucks, where she runs off and cries. However, Duty calls and Ashley morphs on out to take care of everything. She learns about the evil clothes and tricks the rangers into taking them off, turning them back to normal, where they defeat the monster and save Angel Grove from... the evil shirts. The episode ends with Bulk and Skull finally turning back into visible humans. They drink a milkshake and I, I guess that fixes everything. With Detective Stone being genuinely happy to see them, it's heartwarming. As for the rest of the episode, it felt like Mighty Morphin and not in a good way. More silly plots with high school drama, the blue centurion wearing a flannel, it's definitely a little goofy, but let's see where things go. The Wheel of Fate. Elgar informs Diva Talks of two magical and powerful cars that are in space. They're sentient vehicles named Lightning Cruiser and Storm Blaster. They crash land on Earth and Elgar tries to steal them. We get this whole slapstick scene of the villains trying to open the door to get in, but it's a convertible. There's no roof. Why don't you just hop in? They're so stupid. The two cars get the attention of TJ and Justin who go to check it out. Justin and Storm Blaster get taken away, so it's up to TJ and Lightning Cruiser to save him. Of course, with the help of the other Rangers. It's a really good episode, full of action and not a lot of silliness. Fighting Divatox's forces for control over the vehicles where of course the rangers win and have two more cars to fight alongside them. Trouble by the Slice Divatox gets hit with a blast and gives her amnesia. She shows up to a local pizza place and she eats without paying, meaning she now has to work there temporarily. The B-plot has Justin and Carlos playing soccer, where Justin meets a kid his own age and they quickly become friends. It's another very, very silly episode. We spend a lot of time with Divatox working at the pizza joint and messing things up until her bumbling sidekicks come along and accidentally blast her memory back. Divatox then comes up with her most evil plan yet, to create an Italian pizza monster and trap the rangers inside a giant toaster oven to be cooked into a pizza. We're here to toss your salad. Meanwhile, the monster also uses evil pizza to control Storm Blaster and Lightning Cruiser. The Blue Centurion then just magically shows up and tries to free the Rangers from their pizza prison. To say this episode was goofy would put it lightly. However, we do get our next important story bit with the Phantom Phenomenon. While Justin and his new friend are playing soccer, something crash lands on Earth. Justin's friend, who's named Nico, discovers an alien spaceship. 
He shows Justin, but only if he triple promises not to tell anyone. Meanwhile, Divatok sends Algar and some Piranatron to rob a bank. But before the Power Rangers show up to stop them, a mysterious invisible force saves the day. When the Rangers come to the aftermath, they're trying to figure out what's going on, when Cassie thinks she sees something. After this mysterious force stops another attack by Divatox, Cassie manages to stop him, where he says they're on their side before disappearing. The group finds out he's an alien from Eltar, but have no idea where he could be. Justin, however, might have a feeling since he saw the spaceship, but doesn't tell the Rangers because he made a stupid promise to his stupid friend. This is the first time Justin has done something actively annoying and childlike. Which is weird, because throughout this entire series, he's never been written as a kid. He just so happened to be a kid character, but had the same maturity as the rest of the teens. So this just feels weird. Heck, he even goes to check on the spaceship himself without backup because of the promise. Where the Piranatrons spot Justin and Nico and attack. They're on their own, but the Unseen Force becomes visible to save the kids. Divatox sends a missile to blow up his ship, but it turns out it was just a decoy, and his real ship is okay. We don't learn anything about this new guy, but the team dub him as the Phantom Ranger. The episode ends with Cassie clearly having a crush on him. The Phantom Ranger is pretty cool, and to my knowledge, he's an American-made Ranger, not being in the Sentai. Which makes sense, he looks very... American. He was clearly made with a toy design in mind, but I don't have a problem with that. Vanishing Act. Divatox creates a monster that turns everything invisible and translucent. Meaning to the ranger's eyes, everything is gone, but in reality, everything is still there. They just can't see or interact with it. Once again, the rangers get help from the Phantom Ranger, but they all, like, forgot who he was, I guess. Like, at first, he's invisible fighting the Piranatron, and TJ's like, What's going on? Huh? huh? Who's that? It makes no sense. I literally thought I watched these episodes out of order, but no. Anyway, they find and destroy the monster, turning everything back to normal. The episode ends the same as the last, with Cassie swooning over the Phantom Ranger. When time freezes over, Divatox has a plan to freeze the sun, but gets stopped by the Turbo Rangers and the Phantom Ranger. She then creates a monster that can rewind time. Oh, it's just that easy. Lord Zed and Rita had to go through insane rituals and find mystical objects to make that happen, but Divatox can just make a monster. So how far back do they go? To when the Rangers were kids and offs them before they grow up? No, of course not. They go back a few hours to stop the Rangers from thwarting her sun freezing plan. It's kind of a weird episode with odd choices. There's a lot of freezing and unfreezing time, but without any actual time traveling, I don't know, it's whatever. A pretty mid episode. I also haven't been talking about Bulk and Skull because they're just back to their old shenanigans. Every episode has them working a different job they naturally screw up and get into slapstick with. The Darkest Day. After another unsuccessful attack on the Rangers, Divatox's brother, General Havoc, comes to lend a hand. His first order of business is to move Divatox's headquarters into space. General Havoc decides to lead a charge on the Rangers, and is actually pretty successful, taking them head-on in a fight and wiping the floor with them. His generals are these silly-looking morph suit guys. They look just as ridiculous as Zed's evil Rangers. General Havoc then summons his own Zord, Metalosaurus, which is kind of a stupid name. Despite the name, it is a pretty powerful Zord, once again thrashing the Rangers. And to add insult to injury, the Morph Suit henchmen break into the Zords and manage to steal the Turbo Megazord. With all hope lost, the Rangers question their next move, when the Phantom Ranger mysteriously shows up to lend a hand. One last hope. General Havoc begins a full frontal attack on Angel Grove, sending down the Piranatron on the ground while the Metalosaurus attacks the rest of the city. TJ and Justin use Storm Blaster and Lightning Cruiser to try and battle the evil Zord, but it's not putting up the best fight. The Phantom Ranger shows up to inform the Turbo Rangers about a hidden group of Megazords. The Rescue Zords. And to be honest, they're kinda lame. We got a fire truck, a police car, and an actual garbage truck. I get that it's Sentai footage from a parody season, but it's hard to feel like this is a serious battle when the solution is a garbage truck Zord. Regardless, they're pretty powerful and manage to weaken the Metalosaurus and send it back into space where Divatox realizes that the Phantom Ranger is her main threat, and decides that he will be her next target. The Fall of the Phantom 
We kick things off with Cassie, who's swooning over the Phantom Ranger once again. So much so, it's starting to affect her grades negatively. Diva Talk sees this and takes advantage of it, planting a fake love note from the Phantom Ranger for Cassie to meet him at the park. She does and gets captured, where General Havoc offers a trade. The Phantom Ranger in exchange for Cassie. Before the team can really devise a plan, they just kinda dive right in and attack the enemies head on. This plan ultimately backfires, with Cassie literally being turned to stone, and the only way to save her is for the Phantom Ranger to use his Power Ruby, which is essentially his main energy source that keeps him alive. He nobly offers this though when he realizes that Cassie is the one in danger. They save her and all teleport away, where they fight and destroy the monster. However, the Rangers can't locate the Phantom Ranger. The episode ends with him stumbling around a sewer, presumably with not much life force left in him. Clash of the Megazords We start off with Cassie and TJ locating an unconscious Phantom Ranger. They bring him back to the command center where Demetria will use some of her power to keep him alive. Meanwhile, General Havoc sends down the evil Turbo Megazord down to Angel Grove, and the Rangers have to use their new Rescue Megazord to fight it. That's pretty much the whole episode, if I'm being honest. One very long fight scene. Diva Tox is in possession of the Phantom Ranger's Power Ruby, so getting it back is their main objective. Which, of course, after a long fight scene, destroy the monster and reunite the Ruby with the Phantom Ranger. He's very thankful, but gives extra attention to Cassie. Ooh, the Phantom Ranger likes Cassie! He says he needs to leave, but he'll return whenever the Earth needs him. We'll see about that. This was a very enjoyable... seven-parter? The wiki calls it the Phantom Ranger mini-arc, so I guess we'll go with that. Lots of good drama that's taken serious and really solid action. If you pay attention to the background music, you'll also notice that during this saga, they used less epic rock music and focused more on dramatic orchestra that was able to set the mood and be taken more serious. I know we're not done with Turbo yet, but I've been very surprised with the quality of these episodes. This is nowhere near the worst season of Power Rangers like I was expecting. But hey, we still got some time to change my mind. The Robot Ranger while at the juice bar, Justin notices Ashley has a robotic arm. He immediately jumps to the conclusion that she's a robot. And as a viewer, we're kind of inclined to believe this. This is very obviously a robot arm with wires. Okay, I'll admit, you got me hooked. The entire episode has Justin trying to convince the others that Ashley is a robot, keeping his eye out for robotic characteristics. But Justin then sees TJ plugging himself into an outlet, and comes to the conclusion that everyone is a robot. Now that's just ridiculous, right? This has to be some kind of misunderstanding somehow. Does Justin suspect? I think he saw the wires. I agree. He knows too much. Oh. Okay. So after the Rangers fight the monster and save the day, Carlos's face falls off and it turns out that, yeah, Justin was right all along. All of the Rangers are robots. And to add one genuine twist I didn't see coming, Justin is also a robot. It turns out Demetria created them as a test for a second set of rangers, and the Justin we were following throughout the episode was the robot Justin that, according to the show, was built so well and human-like it forgot it was a robot. That is genuinely insane and over the top that I can't help but love it. These robot rangers then get sent to Eltar to be its protectors, and I'm not even gonna think about where the second set of turbo powers came from and how it's not a problem apparently having duplicate powers. Beware the third wish. The rangers are making wishes and Justin wishes to see his dad, who's apparently too busy to ever see him. There's never a mention of Justin's mom, so if his dad is constantly away on business trips, who's looking after him? Anyway, his wish doesn't come true and it's very sad. He shows everyone his special coin that his dad gave him and he's always trying to wish with. Divatox then sends down a monster to steal the coin through the power of Justin's... love, I guess? It's able to turn this coin into a monster that can grant three wishes. Elgar wastes a wish on hair... Are you laughing yet? And Divatox, using the power of a wish that seemingly has no rules, wishes for the blue centurion to be evil. I don't think I need to explain why that's a stupid wish, or the rangers then have to fight the blue centurion. Divatox is about to use her last wish, but Elgar, enamored with his new hair, comedically bumps into Divatox and the coin crashes down to Earth, where it's found by none other than Balkan Skull. The Gardener of Evil. Divatox makes another monster that turns people into bees. Or, I guess, people wearing bee suits. They're ordered to steal the coin back from whoever has it. 
The rest of the episode is pretty straightforward. The Rangers are doing battle with the monster and the Blue Centurion, while Bulk and Skull are running away. They do this until they get the attention of the Rangers and give them the coin. Where the Rangers then wish for all the evil to be erased from the universe. Just kidding! They wish for the Blue Centurion to be good again. The episode ends with Justin's wish apparently coming true, and his dad comes back to say he has a new job in Angel Grove. Who cares? Justin's dad only exists to be busy for his son and occasionally shows up for an event or two. You need CPS called on you, Justin. Fire in your tank. Divatox whines and complains about wanting a flying car. Also, Hillary Shepard Turner is back playing Divatox. I think it was a few episodes ago, I genuinely couldn't tell. So, Elgar manages to steal a piece of Storm Blaster's engine that lets her cars fly. So, Divatox now has a busted flying convertible. But the episode's main focus is on a fire-breathing monster, and then the Rangers fight it. It's kind of all over the place and honestly forgettable. The Turn of the Wretched Wrench Ashley and Carlos are taking an auto shop class and are both pretty terrible at it. We learn that Ashley is taking the class because her dad hinted that girls can't work on cars. So in a way to shove it in his face, Ashley took the class. The human stuff is honestly really good, showing kids that there's no such thing as a skill that's only possible by a boy or girl. I also like how Ashley sucks at working at cars at first, almost giving up and saying her dad was right. She's not just a savant at it right off the bat, she genuinely has to study and work hard to get good. The ranger stuff has them fighting a mechanic monster. After Storm Blaster breaks down, it's Ashley who stays behind to try and fix it. Which she naturally does and saves the day. Spirit of the Woods While jogging in the woods, TJ comes across a random kid named Erutan, where he quickly disappears when TJ gets distracted for a few seconds. A monster then attacks TJ and they fight, noticing Erutan in the distance and getting saved by a strong gust of wind. Before TJ can see if the kid is okay, he's gone again. We then get this epic reveal that Erutan backwards is nature. Yeah, I guess this kid is an embodiment of nature taking human form. Divatox then tries to capture him so she can have ultimate control of the elements. What I really like is that when the rangers come to help, they can't see Erutan. Only TJ can see him. I guess because he was nice and helped pick up some trash in the woods. I like that. It makes TJ feel special. Erutan is awesome. He literally summons a lightning strike from the heavens to assist the rangers. Forget the Phantom Ranger, this is who you want on your team. The episode ends with TJ jogging in the woods again to thank Erutan. He doesn't see the child specifically, but after he spots a deer, he knows that Erutan will always be around. It's a genuinely heartwarming episode, easily in the top five of the season so far. The Song of Confusion Cassie and her friend decide to start a band. Oh yeah, remember that? Cassie wanted to be a pop star? They hold auditions, but everyone is apparently terrible. That is until this rock band shows up and sings the worst song I've ever heard. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant the best song ever since Cassie and her friend recruit them to their band. The members are of course a monster in the Piranatron in disguise. They sing a song that gets stuck in everyone's head, but just kind of. Like, it's not really debilitating or hypnotic. It's no different than any other song in real life that gets stuck in your head. Anyway, the rangers find out they're evil, destroy the rock band, and that ends the Cassie Rockstar saga. The Accident Carlos and another soccer player are in a competition to become team leader. During practice though, the other player sprains his ankle and says that Carlos is the one who did that to him. We pretty much spend the entire episode following around a saddened Carlos who feels guilty for taking away this guy's chance. What's nice is that we the viewers aren't sure if Carlos actually did hurt the guy. We of course learned by the end of the episode that he didn't, and the guy was lying. But I like that they didn't give that away right from the get-go. Cassie's best friend. Cassie has a dog named Jetson, who she loves very much, so Divatox sends out a monster that can turn humans into animals. The rangers manage to fight it off completely unscathed. However, during a second attack, Jetson gets caught in the blast and gets turned into a human. However, Cassie never saw this and thinks that her dog is lost. The episode is honestly really weird. Jetson is fully aware that he is a dog and Cassie is his owner, and even finds Cassie, but doesn't tell her. And it's not like he's happier being a human, he still wants to hang out with Cassie and do dog things like play fetch. I don't really get it. The spell was also temporary and Jetson just naturally turns back into a dog by the end. Kinda stupid, but the episode does have tons of heart, weirdly enough. 
The curveball. Hey, remember when TJ moved to Angel Grove to become a baseball player? Well, here's the one episode where TJ plays baseball. There's a new kid who joins the opposing team. He's really good and consistently strikes out TJ. I thought it was going to be an episode where it ends with him being a cheater, but no, this new kid is actually just really good. This causes TJ to stress out and focus on nothing but being able to hit the curveball. So naturally, Diva Talk sends down a baseball monster that throws unhittable pitches, where TJ once again can't hit the ball and is stressed out. The other kid is also a dick, bragging about how much better he is and obsessed with winning. He then challenges TJ to a bike race and almost falls off a cliff. That is called karma, my friend. TJ saves him and, as gratitude, teaches TJ how to hit the curveball. Now, I'm not a sports guy, but is it really a win if your opponent tells you how to beat them? TJ uses this knowledge to strike out the monster and everyone becomes friends. Carlos and the Count Carlos gets bitten by a bat and gets turned into a vampire. That's it. Little Strong Man. Another good Justin episode. So Justin is trying out for track and field at Angel Grove High, but because he's literally 12, he's not as big or strong as the other high school students. This naturally frustrates him because while he is working hard in training, his body just hasn't fully developed yet. That is until he gets bit by a random ant and he develops ant powers. Specifically, super strength, because ants can lift things ten times their body weight. There you go, don't say I never taught you anything. Naturally, this gets to Justin's head, showing off for his own personal gain. He gets attacked by the Piranatron, but easily mops the floor with them, jumping all over the place and even lifting one off the ground with one hand. The only downside is that he can't morph, because, and I quote, his strength is not compatible with his powers. What does that mean? Alpha then creates an antidote that will give him his powers back, but he'll lose his super strength. He's initially against it, but eventually realizes that his strength only benefits him, while the powers can benefit all of mankind. Like I said, a really good episode. The Rival Rangers There's this new kid that both Ashley and Cassie have a crush on. They then do petty things to each other in order to sabotage the guy potentially liking the other girl. That's pretty much it. Cassie hangs out with them until Ashley ruins things, then Ashley hangs out with him until Cassie ruins things. The episode ends with the guy ending up having a crush on a total random girl. And Ashley and Cassie are left without dates for the dance. I'll take you both. Deal. What? Parts and parcels. Bulk and Skull have new jobs as delivery boys. However, their packages keep getting stolen by the daytime thief. And their boss says that if one more package gets stolen, they'll both be arrested? I don't think that's how the law works, buddy. TJ and Cassie overhear this and say that while Bulk and Skull are kind of idiots, they're not criminals. TJ then takes it upon himself to team up with Bulk and Skull to find the criminals. It turns out it was the Piranatron stealing technology for Divatox. The rangers morph and fight the monster, yada yada, this isn't important. After the rangers save the day though, Bulk and Skull are about to get arrested. That is until the Power Rangers teleport into the juice bar to clear the duo's name, saying that it was their efforts that saved the day. We get another nice moment with Bulk telling Ashley that TJ is pretty cool, and she tells Bulk that TJ said the same about him. Ending the episode with a heartwarming hug. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the finale of Power Rangers Turbo. Chase into Space, Part 1. Justin's dad has an interview for a new job. He tells Justin that if he accepts it, they'll have to move away from Angel Grove. Meanwhile, the Rangers get summoned to the command center for some urgent news. Eltar is under attack by the Alliance of Evil, with Zordon being the one sending this message. He tells the Rangers to stay on Earth to protect it. Meanwhile, Divatox teams up with this random monster who's the most destructive creature in the galaxy. Why he's here teaming up with her, I don't know. The Rangers really want to go to Eltar to help Zordon, but that super powerful monster shows up to wreak havoc on the city. And it turns out he is pretty powerful. None of their attacks seem to do any damage. The fight is given some real tension. There's once again no epic rock and roll playing in the background. Instead, we get the dramatic orchestra. Here's an example of a regular Megazord fight and this one. Ready? Let's do it! Turbo, Turbo Megazord Saber! It's the little things that make a difference. The monster's name, that's not important, manages to severely damage the Megazord, leaving TJ with a drastic plan. 
to self-destruct the Megazord right in the monster's face. It's a pretty desperate move, but all of the Megazord's special attacks haven't been working. So they sacrificed the rescue Megazord. But even that didn't work, with the monster still standing. The Rangers then immediately summon their Turbo Zords to put up another fight, this one going even worse for them, with the monster straight up destroying that Megazord on its own. And just like that, the Turbo Rangers are without any Megazords. TJ's last plan is to attach the Turbine Laser to Lightning Cruiser and fly up to its face to blast it head on. You see why it wasn't important to know its name? Meanwhile, Rygog and Elgar find the Command Center and inform Divatox of its location. Demetria and the Blue Centurion tell the Rangers that they will be going to Eltar to assist in the fight. Justin gives the Blue Centurion a hug and even his dad's lucky coin. Divatox sees that Dimitri and the Blue Centurion teleporting away, and uses this time to launch a full-scale attack on the power chamber. Alpha tells the Rangers that they should leave, but TJ tells him that they're here to stay and go outside to face the evil army. Chase into Space Part 2 The Rangers are fighting with the Piranatron, but their numbers are too overwhelming, with their only other help being Lightning Cruiser and Storm Blaster, who eventually get wrangled and captured by Divatox. The Rangers need to retreat back to the command center. They lock the doors, but the evil forces persist. It's a pretty intense invasion. They're scaling the walls and using battering ramps to knock down the doors. We then get this really somber moment with the Rangers simply sitting there waiting for the attack, where Carlos tries to comfort Justin, getting his mind off the invasion and talking about his dad's new potential job, and whether or not he'll take it and leave Angel Grove. The Rangers' time of rest is short-lived, though, with the Piranatron breaking through the forces and charging in. Alpha tries to teleport the Rangers to safety again, but TJ stops him, saying they're with this until the very end. The battle inside the power chamber is very good. Things are being smashed to bits and are on fire. It's a very devastating sight to see, with Elgar even throwing a hammer to destroy Zordon and Demetria's power tube, cutting off all contact with them. I have seen a few complaints that it's Elgar and the Piranatron that are the forces that destroy the power chamber and stop the Power Rangers considering they've been portrayed as nothing but goofy and incompetent, but I'm okay with this. At the end of the day, having a massive army, no matter how untrained, will still be able to easily overwhelm only five teenagers. This team is also really inexperienced. They were just recently thrown into being Power Rangers, and this is their first real threat. Algar then plants bombs all over the power chamber, before blowing it to bits once again. While Divatox is searching for the Rangers' bodies, Dark, she gets a message saying that she's being summoned to the Sumerian planet by a force known as Dark Spectre. She fearfully obliges to the request, and we see that the Power Rangers are still alive, but badly wounded. And to add insult to injury, they've lost their powers. Carlos says they need to go to space to stop Divatox, and that staying on Earth like Zordon requested would have them be sitting ducks until Divatox returns. They all agree and go to Nasada, which is just Power Rangers NASA and Justin whispers something to the commander. He immediately recognizes what Eltar is and lets the Rangers borrow a spaceship to launch into space. I guess Zordon has contacts with the government. Everyone straps into the ship, apart from Justin, who stays on Earth to be with his dad. The Rangers are saddened by his decision, but fully understand and support it. And with that, TJ, Carlos, Ashley, and Cassie take off in the spaceship. And the episode ends with the caption, to be continued next season, Power Rangers in Space. Definitely an intense way to end the series. This was a way better finale than Zeo, and heck, even Mighty Morphin. Which I think segues perfectly into my overall thoughts on Turbo. It's good. Don't get me wrong, it's not great or anywhere near my top 5 favorite seasons, but again, I avoided this season my entire life because I heard it was hot garbage. But after watching it, I don't fully understand the hate. Yes, don't get me wrong, the villains were easily the worst part. Everyone is an annoying, over-the-top clown that gets on your nerves pretty quickly. The first half of the season with the original cast was very good. I liked the focus on growing up, and the plots weren't too terrible. When the new cast showed up, sure, it was a step back storytelling-wise, with the monster of the day high school shenanigans. But when they wanted to tell a serious story, they did it. Very successfully, in my opinion. Honestly, I'd say Zeo was way worse than Turbo overall. Zeo had one good story, the Gold Ranger stuff, and it took up half the season. 
Justin is usually the main point of contention with fans. They say he's annoying, but I don't think so. Okay, fine. There were maybe like two episodes where he was annoying for being a kid. But overall, he was a fun character. He was the one who immediately sniffed out all of Divatox's plans. He was on the same level maturity-wise to the rest of the teens. Apart from a few occasions, he was never a detriment to the team. Never more so than the other Rangers. If you want to look at the show from the perspective of a viewer in the 90s, maybe you could say it was annoying having a little kid Power Ranger. But how can people still say that to this day that Justin is the worst character ever, when we have a plethora of Nickelodeon era rangers who are written and portrayed just the absolute worst? Bulk and Skull also definitely had a step back in terms of character work. Working random jobs, getting into slapstick, Demetria was also a complete waste of time, a mentor who did zero mentoring. Also, when she left at the end of the season, this is the last we will ever see of her. And quite frankly, I couldn't care less. Alpha's stupid Brooklyn yo-yo-yo voice was also stupid. I do wish they stuck with the Rangers growing up thing that was teased at the beginning, but overall, I like Turbo. It was a pretty good season. I'm not praising it as a masterpiece, but I definitely don't think it deserves the overwhelmingly negative reputation it has. The movie? That sucks. 100%, there's no excusing that. TJ, Ashley, Cassie, and Carlos were all fine. It is cool that Selwyn Ward got to be the first African-American Red Ranger, and so early into the series' history. He brought a new leadership role to the table. The best way I could describe him was as a friendly Red Ranger. Jason and Tommy both had intensity to them. They felt like larger-than-life people, and barely interacted with Balkan Skull. It always felt like they were viewed higher than them. TJ, however, felt like someone you could approach and be friends with. He was never standoffish to Balkan Skull, always trying to be their friends. But with Zordon in danger, our Rangers without any powers, and Divatox on the brink of taking over the Earth, what will happen next? Well, we'll find out next time, as we set controls to outer space.